Morning, Northland family. How's everybody doing today? Sweet. It's good to see you. It's so good to gather as a church in various rooms right here uh, on campus. Some of you are at home online. And of course, we've got our family is joining us at Seminole County Jails and Bridges of America. So welcome, everybody. It's good to be with you. Hey, and if you're brand new, you've never been here before, hey, how you doing? My name is Marsh. I'm part of the worship team here, and we're glad to have you. And we'd love to know that you're here. So you may have noticed in the intro video there, uh, talk of folks with orange lanyards. They're a part of our connections team, and you'll see them walking around, and they are a great uh, point of first connection. They would love to answer questions for you, direct you. Some of them might even just would love to be your personal tour guide for the day. So uh, we'd love to know you're here. One more thing, um, out in the cafe, I think you know every weekend we're having a different ministry from the church kind of staff, staff the cafe. And this weekend we have our Stephen ministers. And if you're not familiar with that ministry around here, Stephen ministers are some really great folks to get to know. Uh, if you are just at the end of it, uh, if you're in just uh, some emotional desperation, you're having a really tough time right now. These are some highly trained folks who want to walk with you one-on-one -on -one through some of life's toughest challenges. So they're out there. If you would like to go encourage those folks, they would love that. If you would like to go avail yourself of their training, please do that. If you think, hey, I think I might be built to be a Stephen minister, please go talk to them. Um, so they're out there and uh, uh, go meet them. Well, we're going to continue today in our Lenten season. This past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, um, and uh, it was good to— actually, it wasn't, was it? It was last week. We're going to continue in our Lenten season. Look at me, missing it all over the place. And John Cortina is one of our governing elders, is going to be uh, teaching us today from, from Luke 4, talking about when Jesus was tempted in the desert. And we're going to follow Jesus' example of how he— uh, fought back against Satan in there with Scripture in something that we have traditionally called let the Bible speak. So if there is some Scripture that has served you well in your life, that ha you have gone to um, when, you are, when you're in a dark place, when you're going through trials, when you're just having a tough time, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and bookmark that. If you've got your Bible app, go ahead and get that ready. If you've got it hidden in your heart, just be ready with that because in a, after a couple of songs, we're going to ask you forward to uh, come and bring the word to, your, uh, to the church, um, and we'll let you know when that is. So get those ready. Folks online, get those ready. Go ahead and type those into the chat. But as we begin worship, why don't we stand, and I'm going to start us off with some scripture from Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run, run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. And let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. Our God of witness on our side, forever lift him high, with all creation crying out. Let 
go ahead and take a seat as we continue in our worship. And now it's time for letting the Bible speak. The people of God are going to take the word of God, speak about the strength of God and the power of God over each other. So I hope you've been thinking about a piece of scripture that, um, that you turn to in a difficult time. There's a couple of microphones down here, down front. Tony and Benita are going to be down there with you to um, help kind of adjust the height of the microphones for you. But if you have some scripture that you'd love to share with your brothers and sisters to hearten the church, um, please come on down. It's a time to let the, the Bible just shine over us. So just let us know the book of the Bible and the verse. Good morning. Just this morning, the fiery darts were coming at me. And I'm grateful for my quiet time because it brought me the scripture. John 10, 27 through 30. My sheep will hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. From 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 5, it says, Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who has also made us adequate. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit lives within us and makes us adequate today. Amen. This is from one of our uh, camera operators. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, use the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Good morning, I'm Sue Ann. I like to pray for others, and this is one of my favorite scriptures. It's Ephesians 1 and 2. I pray that God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ will continue to help you. I pray that you will, that you will give, that he will give you peace in your mind. Amen. Hi, this is from the New International Version, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The uh, closing statement in Ephesians starts like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And put on the whole armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the authorities, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Pray also for all the saints in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is from, this is from one of our, our online church members, Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'll be reading from Psalm 91. 
He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, may God in him who I trust. Good morning, church. This is my favorite verse. This is Psalms 46.10. He says, be still, know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is Psalm 139, which, you know, I could read the whole thing, but I'm not going to. I'm going to start with verse 3. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. And you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. Amen. What I do is um, also I get a lot of flack and, and everything day by day. And um, this is one verse that I teach. Uh, it says, this is uh, Matthew 20, uh, 19, verse uh, 27 to 28. And, uh, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said unto them, truly I say unto you, that the renewal of all things when the Son of Man sits on the right glorious throne, who you, um, excuse me, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And anyone who left the houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, wife, children, fields of my sake, will receive a hundred times as much who inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, many who are first and last will be first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning and hired workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay for them a denarius for the day and set them into his yard. Yes, for those of you that are having difficulty making decisions and you don't know what direction to go to, um, sometimes this has happened to me, and this is the verse that I go to, James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to, to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Amen. God bless you all. Romans 8, 35 through the end of the chapter. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm new here, so. Um, but there's this one verse that always stuck with me, and that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. This is from Psalm 91, 9 through 11. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Amen. From uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Thank you. Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is a verse that uh, any time that I have, my mind is wandering, and uh, the Lord always brings that verse to me. Uh, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in you, Lord, is everlasting strength. Amen. This is a verse that, although it is small and it may not seem comforting, overall, it kind of helps us to remember that Jesus was human and he understands what we're going through and God helped him and he will also help us. Um, John 11:35. Jesus wept. Good morning. I'll paraphrase from Romans 7:14 through 19. The things that I want to do, I do not do. The things that I do not want to do, those are the things that I do over and over again. And that just shows the frailty of human beings. This verse is from Paul Psalm 94, 18 through 19. And it says, when I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, helped me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. So I was a little Say nervous. That one more time. I said my mom made me come up here, so I was a little nervous. <laughs> um, Philippians 4 through 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Amen. 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 Hey church, and let's close with these two. These are these are from our our, um, our folks online. One is Psalm 3418. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And let's end with this one as it's a really good direction as I'm going to ask us to stand. Judges 7, 15. Get up, for the Lord has given you victory. Amen.
God, you won't fail. Lord, would you remind us this morning, we're not held by our own strength. We're held by you. Father God, thank you for fighting our battles because you are a God of victory, a God of triumph. Lord, forgive us for the times where we lose faith in you and forget what you're capable of. God, would you renew our faith and renew our strength this morning? Father God, I wanna pray for our new lead pastor, Pastor Josh Laxton and his family as they're transitioning. Would you give them clarity and some peace of mind in this time of transition and in all the details and decisions that they're having to make? Father, would you give them peace as they join us here at Northland? God, thank you for this time that we've had together to worship and praise you and have your word spoken over us because this is just a taste of what eternity is like with you. Lord, we love you and we love to worship you. I ask these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Thank you, Beth. Beautiful prayer, and uh, good morning. Uh, and God hasn't failed us. He hasn't failed us in our finances. Not, not at all. And I'm here to tell you that. I'm the finance director here at Northland Church. Good morning again, and uh, this is Mike Kim. Mike is our fi uh, finance committee chair and governing elder, and he'd like to invite you to some things here. Yeah. First, I want to notice that Glenn and I are twins today. We, uh, <laughs> I, I like your style, man. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> We're not here to talk about clothes, but I am here to invite you to join us for our finance forum, our financial forum. Uh, when's that happening, Glenn? That is happening today. It is happening after this service. It's going to be at 1230, 4607, 4606, upstairs. You go up the, up the uh, stairs out here and head up there. Uh, and we invite you all to come. If you're online and you can't be here, uh, just send me an email. I'll be happy to send you some of the handouts and the things that we'll be going over. All right. What are we going to be talking about? We are going to be talking about where we are. And if you look at your handy worship guide, you'll see that we're at 97% of donations uh, through January. and February, we dropped off a little bit to 84%. Uh, but we, what we'll talk about in the forum is where we are, where we're going, where we've been uh, financially. And I uh, hope to see you there. We usually have some good Q&A. Okay. And for those who might not know, how can they get involved in and maybe partner with us in kingdom building financially? Partnering with, with us is easy, I hope. It's right here on the back of your worship guide. You can see the different ways to give. Uh, and you've supported us so well through the years. And, and God has really seen fit to, to give us our finances that we need. So we're very grateful for that. Thank you for your support. For sure. And I know that we're going to have a special guest at the Financial Forum today. Uh, Christian Financial Resources will be there. They are our mortgage holder, but they do so many other things in kingdom building. So they'll talk to you a little bit about uh, what they do for uh, churches and for families in kingdom building. So they will be there with us today. Yeah, I'll so. even have a little slide that kind of shows some of the reasons that we engage with them. But it's, it's very compelling. Yeah, very good. Well, um, one other thing that we're doing this year is celebrating 50 years of existence for Northland this year. 50 years. Um, we're so grateful for God's faithfulness. Um, how long have you been here, Glenn? I have not been here all 50 years, <laughs> even though I look like I might have been here for all 50. No, I was not. Okay. Uh, but I got it. 2014 is when we started attending. So, you know, not nearly as long as many of you. I've been here since the early 90s, and I see some faces out there of folks that have been here probably that long or maybe close to that long. So we are grateful for God's faithfulness um, in, in us and through us. And uh, we're looking forward to the next season. Uh, we just talked about uh, Pastor Josh Laxton going to be joining us. We're very, very excited about that. Uh, we're excited for what God has in store for us in the future. 
Um, but you know, one thing will never change, and it's a little bit of what we talked about earlier too, and that is we will always do everything that's going to be grounded in God's Word as He reveals it through His Holy Scriptures. Amen um, so that. with that, I want to invite uh, my friend and our fellow governing elder, John Cortinez. He's going to come and share with us a message from Luke chapter 4. Please welcome him. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike and Glenn. Good to see you guys. And Man, that was so powerful to see the river of scripture that came from you all at these two microphones earlier. We praise God for the power of his word. Can we just acknowledge that one more time, the power of hearing that? I was so blessed um, to see those scriptures, to hear those scriptures from each of you. And, you know, I've got one more as we kick off today. You know, around 520 BC, so five centuries before Jesus Christ came, The prophet Zechariah wrote these words. He said, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And you know, that prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus was killed. You can think about the bitter weeping of the disciples. You can think about thousands of people in Jerusalem and surrounding areas that had hoped this would be the Messiah. And on that dark Saturday with Jesus in the tomb, they felt like that hope had been lost. But you and I know that God was preparing to unleash a resurrection and a miracle that we are still living under the benefits of today. In fact, Zechariah prophesied that. If we go a couple verses later, we'll find this. He says, on that day, There shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. You know, Jesus allowed his hands and his feet to be pierced and his side and his blood, his physical blood flowed out of his body and he did that for us. And Zechariah, five centuries before, said this is going to be a cleansing flow that would cover our sin and give us new life and righteousness in Christ. And so before we even go into today's passage of Scripture, we're going to pause and celebrate what Jesus has done on our behalf. So we're going to do communion together. So when you came in, you likely received the elements for communion. If not, raise your hand. Someone will get those to you. If you're with us online, we invite you to join as well with what you have available in your home. You know, this is a time that we come to together as those who have given our lives to follow Jesus as our Savior, as our Messiah. So we join as a family of faith. If you're just investigating Christianity, checking out church for the first time, but have not given your life to Jesus, we'd ask you to refrain from this time. We come to communion as a body with a couple of postures of the heart. One is just gratitude for that cleansing flow, for what God has done. And the other is with humility, recognizing the sin that exists in each of us. You know, literally yesterday, a a situation happened to me, and I reacted in anger. I responded. And about five minutes later, that conviction came, and I realized that was not righteous anger. That was actually pretty ugly, and that came right out of me. And I had to repent before the Lord and try to make that right. And as I come to communion, I bring that with me and say, Lord, I lay this before you, but the cleansing blood of Jesus has made me clean before God. And each of us can bring those things to him in this moment. So, you know, Paul writes to us as we take the bread. He says, on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread like we have here. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread and remember the body of Christ. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's take the cup and remember the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, your word tells us that when we do this, we proclaim your death until you come again. And we remember as we take this juice, as we take this wine, that your blood was a cleansing river that has taken away our sin. Something we couldn't do, you've done it, Jesus. And as we turn to look at what you did in the wilderness, would you awaken our hearts with awe and wonder and passion to run after you with our whole hearts? It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. 
So you know, the journey of Jesus did not start at the cross. There was testing and preparation and ministry and teaching that he did. And in this series, over the next several weeks, we are going to look forward to Easter together on the spiritual journey to the cross. We're going to follow the Lord on the journey that he took. And in the weeks to come, you're going to hear from Pastor Rob and Pastor Gus and, yes, Pastor Josh, who's going to join us to deliver multiple messages as a part of this series. We are so excited to welcome him here as he joins the Northland family. This week we begin before the start of Jesus' earthly ministry. He had been baptized by John, commissioned for his work, and the voice of God from heaven had declared, this is my son, and then Jesus was led not immediately into ministry, but actually out into the wilderness, and that's where we pick up the story in Luke chapter 4. But before we read that, we want to have context for this. And what Jesus was doing was facing the tempter. He was facing Satan in the wilderness. And so what is the context for the human struggle against temptation to fall out of the purity of following God and fall into sin? Well, of course, if we want to understand that, we have to go all the way back and think about how Adam and Eve were created pure and holy before God, and yet they took the forbidden fruit. We have to think about Noah, who got off the ark of rescue and then got drunk and defiled the righteous standards of God. We think about Abraham, who was selected to bear the promise of God, his his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and yet in his journey we read about the moments of lack of faith, the moments where he had stepped into telling lies to avoid situations. He didn't fully measure up to what God had called him to do. The people of Israel set apart and saw the mighty hand of God set them free, and yet they were unfaithful and sent into exile. And then, of course, there's you and me, born into a prosperous society, given education and opportunities like people for millennia could only have dreamed of. And yet, if we look inside our hearts, what do we find? Do we see perfection in our moral lives? Or do we see lies and lust and self-interest and all of the same things that we see through the story of humanity? Every man and woman and child for thousands of years has faced the same enemy, Satan, the tempter, and fallen short. But then along comes Jesus. There's no one before him. There's been no one since him, the promised Messiah. And in his humanity, he faced the same tempter right there in the wilderness, face to face, son of God, versus the one who ruled over humanity, and Jesus won the fight. And now his righteousness belongs to us by the grace of God. That is magnificent, and the marvelous gospel that we proclaim. The writer of Hebrews can say it better than me, so I'm going to read from the opening of Hebrews, where he says, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That is the Jesus that we celebrate today, which, by the way, when do you sit down? You sit down when the job is finished. Jesus said, it is finished, and he's done the work of defeating Satan. And today, as we turn to Luke chapter 4, we get a front row seat to how he defeated the enemy of humanity. So would you stand with me as we read our main passage for today from Luke chapter 4 and ask, how did Jesus do it? And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours." And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. 
And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. You can be seated. We praise God for his word. And as we look at this passage in Luke 4, we're going to do three things today. First, we're going to look at the passage together and ask, how did Jesus win this battle? And then we're going to break down the three temptations, one, two, three, because each of them is really interesting. There are some lessons that we can pull from them individually for our journeys. And then finally, we want to apply this. We don't want to just be hearers of the word, but doers of it also. And out of Luke 4, there are some things that we can do in our Christian walk, following Jesus. And we're going to ask, what does that mean? look like. But before we really get into the passage, I want to comment on the fasting that Jesus was doing, because that's part of the context of this story. You know, some of you may have fasted for an extended period before. I was talking to somebody in the lobby after the last service that has done a 30-day fast. That's amazing. Uh, I've done maybe three. I've never done 30. Jesus here does 40. But what's amazing is after, you know, you start fasting, no calories coming into your body, the first day, you'd be expected this, you're very hungry. You're very hungry. You're kind of cranky. (laughs) Second day is sometimes even worse, but usually around the end of day two, the start of day three, the hunger goes away. And our bodies are amazing. And what happens is when your body has burned through all the glucose, all the sugar that's in your bloodstream and your muscles, it turns to a fat burning mode and your, your hunger goes away. And your body starts consuming fat to run your brain and muscles and, and body. And, and so you can just cruise along like that for an extended period. But If your body runs out of fat stores to draw from, and there's nothing but muscle and fiber and bone and skin left, you would experience what could be called starvation hunger. And that's where we find Jesus, because it says he was hungry at the end of his 40-day fast. He was up against the limits of what his human body could endure. He's tired, he's ravenously hungry, and he's physically empty. And yet he remains alive to the purposes of God. And so the question we can ask here on this passage is, can you think of another time when Jesus would suffer up to the limits of human pain and yet remain faithful to the purposes of God? We are on the spiritual journey to the cross, aren't we? And before Jesus' ministry even launched, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness and he was being prepared in his humanity, in his flesh, for the ordeal that he would face going to the cross. God prepares us for the storms that are going to come our way. And by the way, this is why we are called to fasting. This is one of the Christian disciplines that is less common in the church today. But we have these physical bodies and our physical bodies have desires related to our physical bodies. And these are God-given desires and eating food is a good thing. And yet we're called to periodically answer the desire of our physical body with a no. And say, no, I'm not going to eat food for for a defined period of time. I'm going to look at God's word. I'm going to pray and cry out to God because I am going to learn self-denial and self-control and become the master of my flesh through the Holy Spirit so that I'm not subject to the desires of the body. I'm awake to the purposes of God. And that's what we see Jesus doing here. So that's just a bonus on fasting. But now we turn our attention to this question Satan arrives to trip up Jesus, but Jesus is victorious, so how did he do it? Before we answer that question, I've got to tell you a little story about my own wilderness experience. So, you know, I did an engineering master's degree when I was a lot younger, and it was over in Saudi Arabia. And one time, one of our professors needed to get some field observations, and so he recruited 10 or 11 of us engineering grad students, and we loaded up into two rented SUVs, and we drove way out into a volcanic region in a remote corner of Saudi Arabia. It was like, you know, find the last camel, hang a right, go 50 more miles, and then you're going to be where you're headed. We actually have a picture of the last camel on the way out there, so that that was a friend I made on this journey. And then we've got another picture of the actual location where we were doing this work. So it looks kind of like something off the set of Star Wars or something, but this was really where we were. It looked like that, and we were taking geophysical observations which sounds really cool, right? But what that actually means is the professor set up geophones that listen to vibrations in the earth, and then we needed to create some sound waves, and we didn't have dynamite, right? It's a low-budget operation. So so the, the grad students get a sledgehammer and a hunk of iron, and you put it on the ground, and you hit that thing, you know, 30 times in a row to create sound waves that the geophones can listen to. So you picture us under the Arabian sun swinging a sledgehammer, a bunch of engineering nerds trying to do this, without the requisite muscles to do it the right way. And yet we're trying to do our thing. And so we work on day one. We've got a 
have a good day, get some good data. We actually had to camp out there. We wake up on day two and we break camp, load up the SUVs, and we're gonna go do some more work in a different location. So we start the first vehicle, get in the second one, and it does not start. You're like, well, this is interesting, but nobody's panicked. We go, okay, no big deal. Let's get the jumper cables and get this thing fired up. Well, they were rented SUVs, and we look in the back, and we look in the front, and we look in the glove boxes, and there are no jumper cables. So now the wheels start turning in our minds, right? We're like, wow, this is not good. There's no way we can all fit in one SUV. There's you know, 11 or 12 of us. So now we're starting to think about, well, who gets the short straw? Like one group is gonna have to ride back to civilization. The other group is gonna be sitting under the Arabian sun, hoping that the first group can find them again. No cell signal. You know, where do you go out there in the middle of nowhere to try and do some kind of a rescue? But what was amazing over the next hour is that we had our own little version of Apollo 13. You got a bunch of nerds who know some engineering stuff and we're like, we can figure this out. We've got one good car, one dead battery. What are we gonna do? And pretty soon you've got somebody with their shirt off and they're holding a tire iron and they're touching one of the batteries with it. And then some of the, we were getting any metal object we could find, we're gonna form a daisy chain of metal. Some stuff was coated in black paint. So now we're like knocking the paint off of these things to get a good contact point. Everybody is using as much insulation as we can find and holding them, touching the, the, the jack that can raise the car up from the tire kit, the tire iron. And we had just enough metal to get from one battery to the other. Not recommended, highly dangerous, right? And yet if you're trapped in a desert, you kind of do what works. And uh, this wasn't copper, it wasn't a good conductor, and so it took about 30 minutes of having this chain formed. It was like electrified human twister, you know, over these cars, holding all these things together. And then we got the second car started. It actually worked somehow. And so we had them going, we drove back to civilization, and you can bet we did not kill the second SUV until we were all the way back, because we didn't want to have round two of this experience. Now, what does that story have to do with Jesus in the wilderness? Well, here's the principle that is, work, that is at work here. It takes knowledge to overcome obstacles. And you have to have relevant knowledge to overcome the obstacles that you face in life. And it just so happened that with a dead battery, we had a bunch of, of people who happened to understand science and engineering, and maybe we can solve the problem that's in front of us to overcome the obstacle that we face. Now, when Jesus was in his wilderness experience, it was a much more difficult challenge than the one we faced. In fact, someone, a challenge that no one had ever overcome before. And he used his knowledge to overcome the challenge in front of him. Specifically, it was knowledge of the word of God. You know, if you think about Jesus, he was divine and he was human. And in his divinity, he could have just rebuked Satan and said, get away from me. He had the spiritual authority to do that. And yet he responded as a model for us in his humanity to defeat Satan. Out of his human nature, he drew upon his knowledge of the written word of God, the Bible, to overcome the temptations of the enemy. And so that is our calling today as well. One thing that's interesting too, I don't want us to miss all three quotes that Jesus gives in responding to Satan come from Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 8. So you go, why is Jesus drawing from a narrow slice of Scripture? Well, in those chapters, Moses says to the people of Israel, you were tempted 40 years in the wilderness to see if you'd be found faithful or not. And Jesus is in the wilderness 40 days as a type for the people of Israel. And he knows Israel was unfaithful, but I'm going to be the faithful Israel, the second Israel, and I will hold fast to the Word of God. And so Jesus is not only quoting Scripture, He's quoting the most profound and meaningful corner of Scripture in the situation that he's in. He knows it front and back, and he spent his life learning it in his human nature. So the question for us that comes right out of Luke chapter 4 is, do we value God's Word, the Bible, as much as Jesus did? So that's the question. We're going to come back to that question, but before we do that, let's look at those three temptations that were faced by Christ. So the first one is the bread, right? Turn the stone into bread. Well, what's underneath that? I would argue that it is this. It's to get yourself out of suffering for doing good or to give up when following God gets tough. I think we've all experienced this. We're following God and it's difficult and the, the tempter comes along and whispers into your ear, come on, you don't need this. Just back out. 
Were you really even called to serving God in this way? Just before, you know, a few weeks earlier, Jesus had been affirmed by the voice of God that said, this is my son. And notice that when Satan comes to Jesus, he says, if you really are the son of God, turn the stone to bread. So what does Satan do? He questions your identity and calling and then tempts you to back out of serving the king, especially when the going gets tough. And so what we need to know here is that if you are in Christ, your identity as a son or daughter of the king, your righteousness, which has been a gift to you, is something that Satan cannot take away or cast doubt into your mind on. We can hold firm to who Jesus Christ has declared us to be through his victory. And we say we don't live on bread alone, but on the words that come from the mouth of God. Now, what's the second temptation? This one, I think, is the biggest one we face in our day-to-day lives. It's the temptation to get power and position and wealth and pleasure by worshiping these things. The devil says, hey, Jesus, you can have all these kingdoms. You deserve to be an authority. Climb higher. But specifically, climb higher by worshiping the devil. In other words, worship power and pleasure in order to get power and pleasure. And this is exactly how the world that we live in works. Whether you're looking at Wall Street or Silicon Valley or Central Florida, right here where we live, this is literally every day what's happening in the world is people worshiping money and power and earthly glory in order to get more of those things. And the thing is, Satan, who's here on this world, can give those rewards until the time we die. And we see that happening. Why do the wicked prosper? That is the temptation that he brings to us as well. And so how does Jesus defeat this? This is so important for us. He says, I worship and serve God alone. It's a single-minded focus and devotion so that when the temptations of the world come to us, we say, no, I'm all about God. I'm not about the things of this life, whether wealth, whether it's power, whether it's status and respect of others, whether it's a number of Instagram followers. I'm not measuring by the measuring sticks of the world. I'm measuring by what Jesus Christ says about me. Now, what about the third temptation? This one is the most interesting on, at the surface level because why would you tempt Jesus to jump off the temple and do like a flying trick or something? You know, this, it doesn't make sense when we first look at it, but if we think about it, this one is very profound. And I think it was the best attempt that Satan made at tripping up Jesus. And yet, of course, Jesus remained faithful. But the temptation specifically is to attempt to compel or control God to control the time and the place when God is going to show up and force him to act. And this shows up in our lives if we attempt to run so hard after supernatural or spectacular miracles to see these things happen. And this can be a challenge with some portions of, of the charismatic movement or the word of faith movement, where it's not just that we believe that God can do great things or ask him to, but we're actually trying to force him into it by our spoken words. We're trying to put God to the test, which Jesus says right here, hey, we don't do that. We are not to put God to the test. There are teachers out there that will say that you can manifest things into being by your spoken words. There are places that will teach prayers like, I command in Jesus' name for whatever it is that I'm hoping for that day, whether a, a significant miracle in my life or whether it's a parking spot at Publix. Big things or little things, but to command them, to speak them into existence. And we have to ask for those doing this, attempting to do this, are we in the place of God? He's the only one who can speak creative power into the universe. If we do this, we're basically painting God into a corner. We're jumping off the temple and then asking God as we're falling to show up because we've painted him into a corner. We're going to bring disrepute to his name or make a fool out of ourselves in the process. God will work on his terms as the Almighty, and we are his children. We come boldly before the throne of grace, and we present our requests to him as the sovereign king who we worship and serve, who saved us, but we also recognize that he works on his timetable and on his own terms and not on ours. Just like we talked about last week, right? We seek after external miracles. Sometimes God gives them to us. Sometimes he does not. But he's always working the inner miracle inside of our hearts. So I want to address this with with a sense of pastoral care. 
After the 9 a.m. service, I had two conversations that were really telling. One was, thank you so much for bringing up that point because I've lost a relative that I care about to these heresies. They've, they've gone into that world and it's pulled them away from the center of the Christian faith. And I had another conversation that said, I, I agree with what you're saying and yet could you be careful because in those movements, our charismatic brothers and sisters love Jesus with their whole heart and they're pursuing him. And to both of those conversations, I say yes. That is so true. That is so true. We are careful about the orthodoxy of the Christian faith, and yet we recognize the diversity and beauty of the Christian faith as we chase after Jesus together. So as we look at these three miracles, we want to recognize that all three of them were actually good things, right? If we look at the life of Jesus, does he feed hungry people? Does he feed people with bread? Yes. Does he show up and and move in power as a leader? Yes, he does. And does he do supernatural signs and wonders? Yes, he does. And so the temptation was to take these good things of God and to make them ultimate or do them on his own terms. But Jesus said, I will only do them on the timetable of the Father, and I won't make them the center of my kingdom. So this is another test for our Christian faith. If the central point, the absolute focus of our Christianity becomes feeding the world and meeting physical needs or if it becomes getting political power and scoring electoral victories in politics, or if it becomes chasing supernatural miracles and saying, where are the charismatic gifts? That has to be our our focus and our first priority. Then we know that we've gotten a little bit off track. All three of those things are part of the kingdom of God, but none of them is the center. The center point of the gospel and God's kingdom has always been the forgiveness of sins unto eternal life in Christ Jesus so that we can celebrate our status as sons and daughters of the King. Amen? So uh, praise God for that, yes. Now where do we go from here? Those are the temptations Jesus faced. Well, I want to spend a, a couple of minutes on this question again that we started with earlier. Do we value the Bible like Jesus did? We are called to be people whose knowledge of the Word of God helps us overcome the trials of this life. And your seasons of preparation, of learning the Word of God, will prepare you for a barren season or a trial. You know, I have a very good friend. We were in our 20s. We were building our lives in in this community. and, And in that season, this guy's wife left him. They had been married a couple of years by all external signs that things were going well, and then this devastation strikes. And can you imagine the pain and the heartache, and again, just the devastation of walking into that season? And again, we were young, and this is a very successful person in the world's eyes, and so think about the temptations that would come to a young man in that circumstance. And so we're walking through this. We're praying with him. We're crying with him. And he stayed faithful to the purposes of God through that season of of utter tragedy. And one of the questions we asked him a couple months later, still walking through this, was, was, hey man, how are you staying so faithful? How are you staying so anchored despite the pain that you're walking through? And it took him no time to think about his answer. He said, the only way is God's word. He said, it's daily time in the Word. This has driven me to the Bible like nothing I've ever walked through, specifically the Psalms, those emotional cries to the Lord for Him to be with me. That has sustained me through this season. And so if we want to be like my friend who is a model of godliness, who, by the way, has experienced a Job-like restoration in his journey through that season of of a horrible uh, time that he walked through, But if we want to be like him or if we want to be like Jesus, who is faithful in the wilderness, we have to learn the word of God. And so how will we do it? And how can we avoid being deceived? And how can we stand firm? Well, of course, it's by sowing the word into our heart. You can think about it this way. Imagine you're here at Northland and you're worshiping and you're admiring the skills and talents up on the stage. And then you just decide, man, I see Pastor Marsh playing that piano and he is awesome. He's so good. You go, I want to be like that. I want to learn the piano like that. And then you go home and you you get yourself a piano and you look up some good lesson plans and you spend three hours a day for a month learning piano. And you go, man, when I finish this month, I'm going to be like Pastor Marsh on the piano. Is that going to work out? Of course not. That's not going to work out very well. You may learn a couple things. This was me over winter break. We got a piano for our kids and I was off work for three weeks. I was spending two hours a day on that thing and and I can play Old MacDonald How to Farm. I mean, I'm pretty good at that one, but 
I, I can even make it a little bit jazzy, but that's about all I've got. That's about all I've got. And of course, the way this works is rather than doing that, it would be, man, I want to learn piano for real. I'm going to spend 20 minutes a day faithfully for a year, for five years, for 10 years. And can you imagine after a decade, every day on a structured plan, what kind of skill you would have? You might be up on this stage leading us in a song. And in any field of human endeavor, this is how it works. Steady faithfulness over the long haul yields expertise and excellence. And we are called to the knowledge of the Bible like Jesus was in Luke chapter 4. So that's where we're going from here. I want to give you four handles on this. You know, you go, I like the idea. How do I get started? Well, first of all, is a resource that can help us in this. And this is the Bible Project. Um, are you anybody familiar with this resource? Show of hands if you are. Yeah, I see several people around the room. This is an amazing group. These are some friends. They're out of Portland. Um, I think there's only five or ten Christians in Portland, and, and maybe they all work at the Bible Project, but it's incredible resources that they've just, yeah, we, we, love, we love our brothers and sisters. We love Portland. Yeah, I just had to do that. This is an amazing site. They've just launched an app. It's an incredible tool, and let's say you want to read the book of Romans, and you're like, it's this big letter, it's theological, I don't know, like, how do I approach it? You can watch a 10, 15-minute video from this team, and it's going to break it down visually and, and, and spoken format and give you an a overview of what does it look like. And then you've got a framework when you start reading. You know where it's going and how to think about it. Really, really good stuff. They come from a great biblical perspective. Second recommendation would be to consider a study Bible if you've never had one and you want to go deeper. Uh, I had mine up here last weekend. If you saw, it was the five-pounder ESV study Bible. I love that thing. You know, when you're reading the Bible, sometimes you, you cross some verses and you go, I don't know what those mean. I don't understand those. Well, in a study Bible, you can jump down to the bottom and you've got notes from a Bible scholar that will help you understand what's going on in the text. You are benefiting from and leaning on those who have gone before you and spent their lives in the Word of God. It's a tremendous tool. The third idea is a little bit different, and it's to let people see you reading a physical Bible, especially for parents. I want to share this encouragement. You know, a lot of us have our Bible on here, and that's great. It's amazing that the Bible is available to us on our phone, but if your kids see you reading the Bible, but it looks like this, you know, if we're honest, they see us doing this too much, <laughs> as it is, and it looks like any other time of day. But imagine being strategic, and let's say you know your kids come out around 7 in the morning. Well, how about 6.50? You sit in the living room with a big, beautiful Bible open in your lap or on the table, and when they come out, you're making a visual deposit into their life. Hey, we're a family that reads the Word of God. You can do this on an airplane, too. You know, when you're sitting on the runway, and there's 150 people in those little rows, and every single person is doing this, you can be the person with a physical Bible in your lap, and someone's going to notice that. Someone may ask you a question, and now you've got a conversation started. Now, fourth point would be memorization. I know many of us who grew up in the church did this as a kid, but maybe not since then. And I would encourage you to this because as we memorize scripture, it's harder than you might remember. It's a challenge. And uh, it puts the word of God in our mind and in our heart. And if you want a verse to start on, I'd invite you to join me. I'm working on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 right now. I don't know of a better 10-verse summary of the gospel than that. It's magnificent. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I would do it for you, but I'm only through verse 5, and it's kind of rusty, so that's not going to happen right now. But we can work on that together and make that deposit into our lives. You know, as a kid, I was blessed with deeply devoted parents in the faith. And mom and dad, I know you're watching. Thank you for a household where we valued God's word, where we valued following Jesus. And I was in a youth group with a culture of pursuing Jesus with whole hearts. We had a contest one time to memorize entire books of the New Testament. I don't remember the crazy prize that our youth pastor had, if anyone did it, but I remember the contest, and I got three chapters into the book of Philippians. We, we sometimes underestimate what a teenager can do in engaging with God's Word. One of my friends did the book of James. And, you know, we were taught in this culture of pursuing Jesus that you've got to start your day in the Word of God. You know, before you eat breakfast, before you get dressed, you've got to have the Bible open. You've got to dig in. You've got to engage. And so that influenced me. And for years and years, I did 20 minutes, first thing, work my way through the whole Bible a couple of times as a teenager. And I remember one time we had one of those family trips. You know, it's, you know, hey, kids, we got to leave at 3.30 in the morning. And you go, okay, I'm going to be ready for that. And in the logic of my 15-year-old brain, I thought, well, 
I better be reading the Bible at three in the morning because that's what we do every day. And it wasn't because I was so smart or I was so devoted. It was the culture I was in. And so Northland Church, this is the culture that we can build together in the families that we're raising and as an extended family of Christ where we honor the written word of God and we pursue the Bible as we pursue Jesus. Now I want to end on this. You may hear all of this today and you may say, I want to go run after knowledge of scripture. I want to do this. But you don't understand, John, you know, I've tried so many times to do it and I've fallen short. I try to live the Christian life that everybody talks about, but I'm just not able to measure up. You talk about the the desires of the physical body and and man, I, I fall short on those. I fall prey to those and I can't measure up to what a Christian life ought to be. And if that's the place you're in today, I have good news for you. And it's the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ has already won that fight. And today we worship the Lord of righteousness for you and me. And the victory that he won in the wilderness is the victory that he sustained to the cross. And it culminated in the empty tomb that you and I proclaim and preach to the world today. We can't earn this good news. We don't deserve it. But God has given it to us as a gift. And it all centers on Jesus. And so as we turn to our final worship song together, our our team is going to lead us in this. And I invite you, as you sing this song, it's a famous song, it's a little bit older, and we chose it for a reason because it reflects on who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And so if you've got this memorized, I want to invite you to sing not just with your mouth and with your lungs, but with your mind and with your spirit as well and meditate with us line by line on what Jesus Christ has accomplished on our behalf as we look toward the journey to the cross that we'll be on together as a church for the next few weeks. So would you stand with us as we worship the King? Thank you, church.
Hallelujah. Only on Christ the solid rock. Will you sit for just a few minutes as we get to just family business? We want to thank our elder John Cortinos for ministering the word to us in this last two weeks. Brother John, we thank you and Megan and the kids for just uh, ministering the power of God's word to us. Now we talk about the Bible. We want to encourage every one of us as Northlanders or whether in person or online to be people of the scriptures. So there are a lot of Bible studies that you can engage in here to go deeper, to go wider. We talk about the Digging Deeper Bible Study that is weekly, but also there are other Bible study groups that convene here. Tomorrow night uh, morning, the women's Bible study is going to get started. They're actually going to be in the book of Acts. They'll be ahead of us. Uh, we'll catch up with you ladies later. And there's a Monday morning and there's a Tuesday evening, both in person and on Zoom. So you can look into that to get deeper. Midweek, uh, during the week, there are other Bible studies that take place here. Every time you go around here, you see cars, men, women, students, children, they are meeting for Bible studies. What will it look like if all the Bibles in the bookstore are sold out, there are Northland people who are reading the Bible. I think the bookstore will be excited about just we being the people of the book. And during this season of Lent, there are many opportunities and resources. When you came in, you may have received one of those or you can get it on your way out about the series that we're in this uh, Lent. Between now, you have about four options to read scripture, to pray, to engage, so that we can grow closer to Christ alone. Encourage us to look at those opportunities we have there. There are other things we can celebrate. Did you really want to celebrate yesterday was Serve Day. There are about 100 or so people here. Yes, thank you for those coming. You can see those pictures there. Some came here for the worship, and then some went out and served, and then some even went out. The other event last night was skate night, like the Maury family. I, I don't know how you're feeling so, John, John, but they did it all. Thank you for doing that. They prayed for all of these seats you sit on here. Thank you, LaDonna and JT leading. Every space you can walk around here is prayed up and beyond. So this Lenten season, you could do that. Our students also had a great event. Uh, this past week, they went to the Lift uh, Retreat where they are digging into the Word. They are having relationships with Pastor uh, Rob and his team. So there are lots of ways that God is showing us as a church. And thank you for those. We don't have your pictures here because you may have fallen down from skate night last night. <laughs> but thank you for also supporting the children and family ministries here at Northland. Some of us are going to go from this service right out to the uh, financial forum. There's a lot that you heard um, Mike and Glenn shared, and there's a lot of articles that are written even in our worship guide each week that we can celebrate as we come here. Stephen's ministry will be in the cafe, and make sure you stop there. Oh, by the way, you pick up your kids before you head out to the financial forum. <laughs> or you'll be paying more for childcare. No. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Just make sure you pick up your kids that we head to the financial forum. Stevens Ministries in the cafe. You may want to connect how you can learn more to be a Stevens minister or maybe seek to receive the care and love that Stevens Ministry gives to families and individuals. A quick question. What did we announce last week? What is his name? Pastor Josh Laxton. So we want us to continue to pray. Go on the website. You can see more about praying. And Joni, his wife, told us to pray for the details. Leaving Chicago, coming to sunny Florida, Orlando in particular. And pray for our hearts as we prepare to receive them. And they also prepare to join us. Those are ongoing things that God is doing in our congregation. We're going to end up by praying for other countries far away. We're going to pray for Ukraine. I invite you, please, to stand with us before we get the good word that we can pray for our brothers and sisters who are out there. We've just had a wonderful service of preaching and teaching, but that may not have happened in Ukraine, in Poland, in Romania, in Moldova, all those countries around. But we owe it to them to remember them in prayer. So we're going to pray for them, and then I'll give give the good word. Father, we remember our brothers and sisters in the country of Ukraine, not southeast, west. Father, and all the nations 
that come to that country, Father, to seek you or to learn and to grow. So we pray for the people who are now scattered as refugees in those countries around and those who are still stuck there. Lord, protect, provide food, shelter. Protect them from the enemies there, Lord, and we pray for the enemies of the nation of Russia, Father, that we continue to suppress them. We pray, God, you are King Jesus, the mighty one, that you will stop this evil. And we pray that you will give people uh, ways that they can get out and be safe. Lord, we thank you that your word tells us that we owe it to our brothers. May we see your kingdom come and may you reign through this tragedy and wartime in that country. So Lord, we believe you for rescuing our friends and our brothers and sisters. And now, Father, as we go from this place, I'll read up a good word benediction from Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart and let me not stray from your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. May we go with the word of God before, behind, and around us. Our service is ended. Thank you.